Good morning everyone. We are delighted to welcome you all to this webinar on transforming your institution into a digital institution. Brought to you by Global EdTech Solution Provider Kamu along with Snetel Technologies. We will play a short video introduction to Kamu and we will continue with the webinar. Thank you for joining. from Snetel Technologies Vietnam. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our participants who have joined from different time zones, our esteemed panelists, and our guest speaker for the day, His Excellency Council General of India to Richmond City, Dr. Mother Mohan Shetty, for joining us for an exciting session on transforming your institution into digital institution, brought to you by Kamu, a global edtech solution provider, along with Snetel Technologies Vietnam. Kamu offers a unified SIS and LMS solution on cloud, and the company has helped transform the learning experience of 400 plus institutions, 1.5 million students across seven countries. Kamu is represented by Snetel Technologies in Vietnam. We thank you for taking the time out to be part of this virtual conversation. One of the biggest takeaway from the past 19 months is that Institutions need to think beyond the physical campus and adopt strategies that can serve students anytime in any location. Learning without disruption is of paramount importance in today's context. Going completely digital is the only way to help institutions to drive efficiency, increase student engagement, and grow revenue. So the next one hour will focus on how institutions can adapt technology transformation and become fully digital by embracing the change. Thank you once again. Đầu tiên tôi xin được gửi lời chào trân trọng nhất đến tất cả các quý vị đến từ Việt Nam cũng như đến từ các quốc gia khác. Tôi là Tâm đến từ Snedo Technology Việt Nam. Tôi rất hân hạnh được chào đón những quý đại diện đến từ các múi giờ khác nhau, các tham luận viên diễn giả khách mời của chúng tôi trong ngày hôm nay Tổng lãnh sự Ấn Độ Tiến sĩ Madan Mohan Sethi sẽ cùng chúng tôi tham gia một phiên học thú vị về chuyển đổi tổ chức của bạn thành tổ chức kỹ thuật số do Camu, nhà cung cấp giải pháp AdTech toàn cầu cùng với Snedo Technology Việt Nam mang đến cho bạn Camu cung cấp giải pháp SIS và LMS hợp nhất trên đám mây và công ty đã giúp chuyển đổi trải nghiệm học tập của hơn 400 tổ chức 1,5 triệu sinh viên trên 7 quốc gia, trên 7 quốc gia. Camu Yosnido Technology đại diện tại Việt Nam. Chúng tôi cảm ơn bạn đã dành thời gian tham dự hội thảo ngày hôm nay. Một trong những điều rút ra lớn nhất trong 10 tháng 19 tháng qua là các cơ sở giáo dục cần suy nghĩ xa hơn về khuôn viên, vật chất, áp dụng các chiến lược để có thể phục vụ cho sinh viên bất cứ lúc nào, bất cứ thời điểm nào. Học mà không bị gián đoạn là điều quan trọng nhất trong bối cảnh ngày hôm nay. Chuyển sang kỹ thuật số hoàn toàn là cách duy nhất để các tổ chức thúc đẩy hiệu quả, tăng mức độ tương tác của sinh viên và toàn doanh thu. Vì vậy, trong một giờ tới, chúng tôi sẽ tập trung vào các tổ chức có thể áp dụng, chuyển đổi công nghệ và trở thành kỹ thuật số hoàn toàn bằng cách chấp nhận sự thay đổi. Cảm ơn một lần nữa vì đã tham gia. Thank you, Tom. Now it's the time for me to introduce our keynote speaker, His Excellency Dr. Mother Mohan Shetty, Council General of India to Ho Chi Minh City. Dr. Mother Mohan Sethi joined Indian Foreign Service in 2006. From 2006 to 2008, he was under training at Foreign Service Institute, New Delhi. 
From September 2008 to September 2010, he worked as language trainee in the Embassy of India, Yangon, also holding the full responsibility of culture and information wing of Indian Embassy. From September 2010 to Feb 2014, he was the Council General in Consulate General of India, Mandalay, Myanmar. From March 2014 to August 2017, he handled the responsibility as political and commercial officer in Embassy of India, Rome. In the absence of the regular officer, Dr. Shetty also represented India in Food and Agriculture Organization, International Fund for Agriculture Development, and World Food Program for a period of 13 months from July 2016 to August 2017. From August 2017 to April 2019, Dr. Shetty handled work related to ASEAN ML Division in Ministry. Dr. Shetty has acquired good organizational skills and experience while handling different and challenging positions. Now, I welcome His Excellency Dr. Madan Mohan Shetty to deliver the keynote speech. Sir, please. Good morning to all of you. And I'm very happy that uh, the Kamu and uh, Stintel from Vietnam both are organizing today event. This is quite apt uh, in the background of the COVID situation, which we all have faced, the whole world has faced for the last uh, 17 or 18 months. We all know when the crisis started last year in January and how the crisis spread out throughout the world. The whole world was literally on move and the whole movement stopped immediately. Apart from lots of economic loss, the most other loss which everyone feared was the educational loss for the children and for the students. And as we know, immediately the technology came to our rescue and digitalization process started in a big way. I understand that the digitalization process was there already, but it could have taken another five to seven years to get implemented throughout the world. But the crisis has turned the process and almost all the institutions, private institutions and government institutions in some countries, they immediately took advantage of the technology of digitalization to allow their schools to function uninterrupted for the student. Uh, friends, I must tell you, India is a big country. India also suffered a lot. But being the IT hub of India, we got lots of suggestions from the IT fraternity how to run our courses, how to, to minimize the loss due to education loss, as physical training, physical attendance in schools were now more possible. And most of the institution, private institution, they immediately adapted to the system. They went for distance learning through the video mechanism. They started using different type of curriculum, course curriculum. And the best part is that now you can talk to students, you can teach students at their time of convenience, convenience. And accessibility also was a, most of one of the important factor which the, most of the students in India got the advantage. And now the whole world is going to a new normal position. We understand that this lesson process is going to stay. As we all know that education is very, very important not only pre-primary education, but also higher education, but also research and development. Although it is a, only a single component for a society, for a country, but its impact lasts for longer times. If we, we have high educated society, high educated people, high educated citizens, the impact on a country's overall growth and development is literally immense. And there was a fear factor that whether our children, our student will lose one year due to the COVID crisis. Fortunately, this uh, digital transformation has helped India and has helped other countries also to adapt to the situation. But what is the unique part of this uh, digitalization process? The best part is that you got adapted, you adopted a new technology. You can teach your student at any time of your need. You can make the class size as you like you can allow the foreign teachers the foreign scholars where earlier people used to travel visit stay an additional expenditure on anyone now they can also stream their valuable lectures 
from other countries to the countries of intention. Apart from that, it is a learning at your own pace, at your own ease, and with lots of positive uh, inputs like question answer sessions, your doubt clearance. I understand that in India, some of our institutions now they have become gone for e campus, e universities, e course curriculum, e classrooms, even e seminars, e discussions, everything. And in the last seven to eight months, the platform like Zoom and others, they have also helped a lot in organizing not only official meetings at the highest level, but also has enlarged the scope of learning knowledge in a big, big way, big, big way, I must tell you. So it is a new normal which is happening throughout the world. We have to adapt it. Earlier, the pernicious problem most in the Southeast Asian countries is the quality of education, the quality of teachers. And by digital transformation, I'm sure these two important factors can be waved up. We can use best quality education. We can contextualize. Instead of going for contextualized curriculum, actually, the curriculum can be enhanced in its content and as per the need of the industry, as per the need of the society. And the teachers, all teachers may not be good, definitely. So definitely, quality teachers can be utilized more and more to deliver their lectures to the students. What I personally foresee is that uh, it will take go for a different kind of revolution, which we had industrial revolution in 14th century. This will be a kind of educational revolution. Earlier, the countries used to have have or have nots. People used to assess, no assess. But here it is the digital medium, only just by a smartphone, only by a desktop, one can assess the best of the best knowledge of the world in a click of a mouse. And the ease and the comfort is also allowing will allow more number of people from poor countries like Africa, India, and Southeast Asia to join the course than going for costly projects. So here I must compliment uh, Kamu and the Stintel company from Vietnam for coming high to uh, invite the educational institutes to go for a digitalization where they can offer different kinds of solutions. Vietnam, as I know in the last one year, it has large potential to become one of the most developed country in Southeast Asia. The country is growing, the country will grow due to its inherent strength. And here, uh, most of the people, they used to provide, they used to give priority to education as a number one out of all their goals. So here, this uh, digitalization process to transform the government schools, the private schools in a big way and allowing people who were earlier not in the formal education, or who are in the formal education but could not join the formal education due to poverty, due to financial necessity, can now join. And the way I told, it will going to make a different kind of changes to the whole world. Actually, when people get educated, and people will be educated at low cost, and people will be able to understand more and more things from other parts of the world, it will definitely lead to a better and safer world for all of us. So thank you, Kamu, again, and uh, thank you, Stintil, for coming forward. We'll be happy if you, you need any kind of support from my office to connect to the universities, the schools. We can help you to un uh, conduct some pilot projects in some of the provinces, and we can support you uh, with full of our state. Thank you, and I'm signing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madan Mohan Sethi. Uh, uh, thank you for taking the time out to be a part of the session. Uh, it was rather insightful, I must say, that you know the kind of uh, digital transformation that's uh, taking place in Vietnam and rest of the world, and how Vietnam is poised to embrace the change that's happening uh, in terms of uh, uh, transformation uh, of the educational institution. Uh, we once again thank you for your participation and uh, sharing your insights. Uh, on this webinar. We definitely would uh, keep in touch with you or uh, take the uh, discussion forward. Thank you for joining us, so thank you. Uh, and it's now uh, time for me to invite the moderator for the panel discussion, uh, Mr. Uh, Brian O'Reilly. Uh, let me give a brief introduction to him. Uh, Mr. Brian is the MBA program coordinator and former deputy director of industrial relations and Technology Transfer Center at the Vietnamese German University. Uh, Brian has been working in Vietnam 
for over 20 years in higher education, management consulting, including business coaching and corporate training. His work has been for clients coming from many parts of Vietnam and also countries such as uh, Australia, Germany, uh, and the US. Uh, he has extensive experience in higher education and has launched Vietnam's first 100% foreign MBA program in uh, Vietnam to, in 2003. Uh, he's also the former president of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam and served on the board for over 12 years. In addition, Brian also serves as the chair of uh, education and training working group of the Vietnam's Business Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Brian. Uh, Brian, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Caroline, um, and welcome everybody. Um, firstly, I would like to um, just do an introduction of our three distinguished panelists before we move into the question and answer session. And I would like to start with Professor Julia Gamester, who is the Dean of the School of Design and Communications and the Dean of the School of Science and Technology at RMIT University, Vietnam. Um, Julia is responsible for ensuring the quality and currency of the school's portfolio of courses. Her background is in fashion and her previous roles include Professor of Practice and Associate Head of School at the Institute of Textiles and Clothing at Hong Kong Polytechnic University and Associate Dean of the School of Design and Technology at the London College of Fashion. Our next panelist is Ms. Kim Green, who is the head of school of the International School Ho Chi Minh City. Kim is currently the head of the school and also um, serves as the co-chair of the American Chambers of Commerce Education and Training Committee. As a leader in three program international baccalaureate world schools, she is committed to creating strong connections across the learning continuum through impactful leadership, a strong curriculum that leads to mastery and mindful practices that place student well-being first. And our last um, distinguished panelist is Mr. A.R. Swamy, who is the co-founder and CEO of CAMO, an integrated SIS and LMS solution on cloud. Swamy co-founded CAMU in 2014 and has been instrumental in taking CAMU to seven countries, onboarding 430 plus educational institutions with 1.2 million students. He has an outstanding track record in the implementation of education technology for academic administration and learning management. Swami has helped several leading institutions in India and across the globe to transform to the choice-based enrollment adopted global, adopting global best practices. So welcome to our three um, distinguished panelists. Um, now I would like to move on to um, an introduction and I would start um, with Julia first. Um, Julia, can you please introduce yourself, your organization, and what have you been doing in these current turbulent times? Good morning, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, yes, as my title says, I look after two of the uh, three main higher education schools at RMIT University of Vietnam. The university has been here for just over 20 years um, and I have been here for four years and love the country and uh, love working for RMIT. Um, of course, the last 18 months have been challenging, but also very rewarding. Um, we were very fortunate that we already had excellent tools to support online learning and many staff with a lot of experience in online delivery. I actually spent five years in a previous institution as a head of e-learning. Um, we saw what was happening around the world. And so we had a, a little bit of time to plan and implement additional training um, to make the switch to online fairly seamlessly. Um, of course, some of the more practical subjects um, required a little bit more adaption to work in an online environment. Um, but I think the key thing was we also moved all of our support services, including our social events to online to ensure that students could get all of the support that they needed, not just the teaching and learning. And I think that's a really key thing about digitization, 
it, you have to think about the bigger picture, not just the classroom. Um, so for next semester, we're planning to start online to give staff and students time to prepare for the return to campus. And we'll then be offering a menu of different delivery modes. Um, some of our courses will stay online, others will be in blended mode and others will be offline. Um, and this has been carefully designed to ensure that as many students as possible, including those who cannot immediately come back to campus, um, will be able to continue with their studies. So that's what we've been working on the last few weeks. And uh, we're really excited to be moving into our new semester um, on the 16th, uh, 18th of October. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. That's been very interesting. Um, now I'd like to move on to Kim, and I'll just repeat the question just in case. Can you please introduce yourself, your organization, and what you've been doing in these current turbulent times? Thank you very much, Brian. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Kim Green, and I'm the head of school at the International School of Ho Chi Minh City, or known commonly as Ishmic. Um, we are a EE to 12 school, EE to grade 12 school. We have about 1,300 students, and we are an international baccalaureate school, an IB school, and offer the PYP, MYP, and DP programs. We have been here in Ho Chi Minh City for 28 years. We were the very first international school here in Ho Chi Minh City and the very first IB school. Um, we have 22 years of graduates um, who have all graduated from ISHMIC as digital citizens and all have been very prepared for the future um, workplace, which has a very strong digital focus. Um, however, for all 60 of our nationalities, we have never been challenged the way that we have been challenged over the last two years before. And I believe that the last two years for us as a learning organization has certainly accelerated the use of educational technology to be able to enhance the learning experience for our students. We have been uh, in a scenario at Ishmic where we embrace blended learning on a daily basis. Um, but the last two years have certainly meant that we've needed to look at how we can expand and utilize technology in different ways so that our inquiry-based program can be lived in a true authentic way through a virtual context. Um, we currently have our students working in home-based learning and have now for all of this school year so far. Um, and we are delighted that the services that we've been able to transfer into that virtual world have meant that each of our students every day are still flourishing and growing um, and continuing their academic journey. I agree with what Julia says that certain areas and certain domains of school life um, transfer into a virtual context more easily than others. But I'm very grateful for the fact that we have a really innovative and creative team who are incredibly dedicated to our student body and their continuous learning. And like Julia, we've been able to transfer all of our holistic um, operations into a virtual context, um, after school activities, engagements for students to be able to connect socially, um, in addition to ensuring that we are able to connect with our parent community and offer virtual admissions tours and opportunities for new families to be able to explore and know what we have to offer. Um, I could go on forever, Brian, but I will stop there and I will let you pass on that mantle to <laughs> oh, Thank you, Kim. There's plenty more questions coming. Um, okay, last but not least, I'd like uh, Mr. Swami, the CEO of um, CAMO, to introduce yourself, your organization, and what you've been doing in the current crisis. Thank you, Brian, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Swami, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO of uh, CAMO. We're an edtech company offering a SIS and LMS solution. I have been very fortunate in, um, to have worked in some way with about uh, 420 odd institutions across seven countries on, um, on digital transformation and uh, pedagogical transformation. So we've been very fortunate to have uh, had that experience. Uh, lots, of, lots has been said about uh, uh, the, the technology and uh, you know, going digital in the last couple of years. Lots has been said. But I'd like to just highlight a couple of um, um, things that uh, what we felt were, were, was quite impactful. Um, so when the, when the challenges came with the pandemic, the ad hoc reactive uh, things that uh, people had to do was done and was done um, you know, rapidly. And uh, that sort of helped people take their own, you know, go through their own journey to go digital. But what's, um, 
uh, quite notable if people you know came to uh, were, were able to adopt that uh, the digital transformation in their culture that was quite uh, quite important people came to you know there was no no way out and digital transformation was the only way but adopting it and you know into the culture was quite important there were um, you know instructors uh, quickly learning how to create digital content the way you engage to uh, the learners um, online is going to be very different and people quickly realize that uh, that's it's not going to work the same way and the the uh, the rapid uh, you know means people used to transform is quite quite impressive of course i agree with the uh, with julian kin not all aspects can be just transformed to this medium uh, and institutions and people will evolve you know how you deal with the hybrid how do you deal with the the emotional and psychological the aspects as part of the education uh, system but um, i think lots have been um, uh, a lot lot of progress has been made and uh, throughout the session i'm sure you have more questions for me it's all good to be around uh, how we as individuals transform to use the tech tech is simply an enabler how do we use uh, how do we transform the learners and instructors what changes we undergo that will be the uh, uh, key aspect that i'll cover in most of my response right Oh, back to you. Um, thank you very, very much. I, I think it's great for the audience to have people who have all been involved to various degrees in ed tech, um, from a university level um, through to K to 12, and of course as an ed tech provider. So the next questions I'm going to focus on both um, Julia and um, Kim, and maybe I'll start with you, um, Julia. Um, the traditional students' experience was to study everything on campus. What is happening now? What are the learning patterns that you're seeing evolving these days? Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, well, I, I think I'll start off by saying that even before COVID, um, our students were using a lot of online resources and platforms for their studies. They used them to conduct research, to collaborate, particularly global collaboration um, and to participate in events. So I think the main transition for them uh, was the move to the lectures, the workshops and the, the labs being online. Um, and I think the key thing is it's important to adapt and adjust the teaching for this delivery mode. You, you can't just replicate what you would normally do in the classroom. So um, creating authentic activities um, is the key. So students see the relevance to what they're doing and also getting the engagement. Um, you know, it's very different sitting in a lecture room and listening to somebody talk um, for an hour or so um, to sitting and watching a talking head on screen for an hour or so that's not very engaging for anybody I don't think um, so we've, we've we found lots of ways to develop interactivity um, we've actually found that even though you know most students would of course prefer to be on campus with their mates and and uh, being able to see people face to face that that a lot of them actually thrive in the online environment um, because they're able to revisit topics um, from the session recordings at their own pace, at their own time, um, when it suits them. Um, and a lot of them are more confident to ask questions in an environment where they can be anonymous. Um, you know, there's nothing more scary than sticking your hand up in a lecture theatre with lots and lots of other people. Um, so the environment makes it a, a safe space for them to be able to do that. Um, in fact, we found that the standard of work produced during this period to be just as good and, and you know, often stronger um, than it was when we were offline, um, whether that's because there's less distractions or, or that it is actually something about the, the online environment that helps students to, um, you know, to develop their skills more, uh, I'm not sure, but certainly um, a lot of the lessons that we've learned from the online experience, we will be transferring back into the classroom. Um, so I think, you know, agility and innovation are, you know, the key values that we apply um, to our teaching and learning and um, to developing our students' experience. Um, we want them to 
experience teaching and learning in a way that enables them to develop the skills that they'll need for future ways of working. And, I, you know, increasingly that is digital. Um, in my own area, fashion, um, you know, you, you're constantly online to people. A lot of the communication is done through online platforms. A lot of the meetings are across time zones. That's something we've all had to get used to. Um, so I think, you know, there's real positives that um, we're bringing to both our online and offline modes of study uh, that have come out of this experience. And I have to say, our students and our staff have been fantastic. They've taken this in their stride with barely drawing a breath. Um, and I think it just shows how resilient um, we can be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. It's good to see people are transitioning. And I suppose for um, older people like myself, you have to realize that most of these students are um, born into the digital age, so it's not a big change for them. Um, Kim, would you like to give the kid a question? Do you want me to repeat it? It's okay, Brian. I think okay. we're talking about um, the learning patterns that we see evolving as a result of the journey that we've been through. Um, a little bit like Julia, within our context here at Ishmik, our students have um, been engaging with educational technology for many years and it's a very much lived part of the face-to-face -face physical classroom environment. Our students will transition and engage with educational technology to support them in research, to be able to collaborate, to be able to create and to be able to present their ideas and their thinking. I think as we've moved into an environment where our students are using technology all of the time to be able to access their teaching and learning. What we're seeing in our community is quite a different evolution of self-management skills, quite a different evolution of um, autonomy that the students are gaining over their own learning. Um, Alan November speaks about um, who owns the learning and he speaks about how educational technology can allow students to have more ownership of their learning because through educational technology, they can create and share, they can participate and work in a, in a meaningful way and engage with others on a much broader scale. And Julia mentioned that, that collaboration you know, across, across global boundaries, across national boundaries. Um, and I think what we see as a community here at Ishmik is we see that resilience of our young people. We also see their agility and their ability to adapt um, at a very fast rate to the digitized environment for learning. Yeah. And I concur with what Julie has mentioned as well about achievement. You know, I know that there is a lot of conversation globally about learning gaps and concerns about students learning gaps. Um, I would argue here in our context, which I acknowledge is a privileged context that we're in with our, in, our children having access to the hardware um, to, and the software to be a, and the learning management systems to be able to access and engage but we are seeing very strong academic growth. Um, I think one of the pieces and one of the trends that is connected to this though is, and it's, a, it's an awareness and that we must have consistently is how do we ensure the social emotional well-being of our children when they happen to be in the context that they are at the moment? How do we transfer that development of social emotional skills through the virtual context and how do we continue to foster opportunities for social emotional development and not just defer directly only into that academic domain. Okay, thank you, Kim. And when I've still got you here, I'll, I'll go on to the next question is, what does the future look like? What is typically the roadmap in relation to the digitization of learning at your institution? It's a great question, Brian, and it's a question that we are in deep conversation about um, almost on a daily basis at the moment. You know, we are very aware that as we bring our children back to school, that some of our children will be able to access the campus physically and some children will not. And we're aware that the world that we live in is possibly going to create more times of turbulence or disruption and possible times where our children may need to move back into that home-based context. So we are engaging in conversations about how can we make sure that we create a fluidity and an adaptability to different contexts that each child may experience? How can we make sure that every day, every child will be engaged in continuous learning? So our team are currently looking at how that frames 
um, by deploying concepts from blended learning, deploying concepts from hybrid learning, um, and then also looking at other creative solutions where we can become much more flexible and agile on a daily basis on campus so that we can create opportunities for students to access learning through a virtual context or a face-to-face -face context. Um, in, a, in an early years to grade 12 environment, it's really interesting. You know, how do you do that with three-year-olds? How do you do that with four-year-olds? How do you create that iterative space where one day our children may be able to be with us physically and one day they may not? Um, and I think that that is um, the really exciting part of what comes ahead of us. And I believe that the future for us is a space where our families and our children will need flexibility. And the space for us as teachers is to identify how we can create meaningful learning experiences that can connect children who may be in different locations at the same time. Now, Ishmik has such a diverse population that the last 18 months to two years, we've had children who have been in country, who have been out of country. And last year, when we began the school year, we had a number of children that couldn't return to Vietnam. And at that time, we deployed a lot of strategies to be able to have students access the teaching and learning from distance and from different time zones. So mixture of asynchronous, synchronous, mixture of um, utilizing our ed tech tools so our students can deploy their autonomy, their agency and their ownership over their learning. And I would say like Julia, uh, enormous amount of resilience and a lot of creativity that's been deployed and will continue to be deployed on, um, by our teaching team. Okay, thank you very much, Kim. And Julia, what about the um, future for higher education? Well, I think the future is exciting, um, Brian. I mean, I, th I think, uh, as Lindsay said earlier, um, you know, the way that uh, technology has developed over the last 18 months has kind of really taken a, f a forward leap. Um, and uh, at RMIT, we'll continue to um, offer a range of different delivery modes according to what works you know, best for the subject and the activities and the, the situation of the students. I think that's really important. It's not a case of one size fits all. Um, you have to have variety and flexibility and, and that's becoming, as we've seen, increasingly more important for learners. Um, there are new tools emerging all the time, of course, that support different modes of study. Um, and we find that our students really love to have that flexibility um, to be able to study where they want and when they want to be able to revisit things. Um, and it's not just in the online uh, arena that we use digital tools. We also use them to enhance the experience in the physical classroom and to enable the integration of offline and online. And I think, you know, um, I, I, I kind of have an issue now with this e-learning because all the learning that we do uses technology. That I don't really see that hard boundary anymore. I think it's much more fluid. And you know, so you say to the students when they're looking up uh, an e-book in the library, "Oh, you're doing e-learning." They're, they're kind of like, "No, I'm just learning. That's what we do now. <laughs> um, that's how we learn." So I think you know, um, the big key things for me are it's not so much around the tools. It's about um, how you apply the pedagogy, um, how you make sure there's an increased level of engagement and support offline or online, um, and, and not looking for solutions to fit a technology. I think, you know, this is where some of the mistakes have been made in the past, like there's a whizzy new toy and like, oh, let's all jump on and use that, but not really understanding how it's going to add any value um, and, um, you know, what its purpose is. So rather than trying to find a solution for their technology. We try to find, um, you know, technological so solutions that will support our teaching philosophy and add value to the learning experience, um, whatever the mode of delivery. So we'll continue to invest in technologies um, to bring our learning environments, um, keep them up to date and uh, facilitate all modes of study. But it's also about finding ways, um, you know, as Kim said, we, we are privileged um, in that our students do have access to good facilities and resources, but we are also aware that there are a community out there that 
that don't have that immediate access or can't come to the big city. So finding ways to um, engage the wider community uh, and a wider range of students, I think, are also really important to us. And, and I totally agree with Kim that it's it's all about enabling the students to own their own learning, um, because what once they leave university and uh, they enter the world of work, they've got to be able to adapt and solve problems and be resilient and agile and flexible, because that's the world we now live in. And I think you know everybody talks about the new normal, and um, I don't think there ever really was a normal. Um, change has been constant for the 30 plus years that I have been in education. It's just sped up a little bit. Thank you. Um, thank you, Julia. I think it's um, um, really um, good to hear from your two institutions, ISMIC and RMIT, that whilst we have gone through turbulent times, both of you have been able to adapt and maybe even thrive in this um, changing situation. So that's very, very um Positive. I'll stay with you, Julia, for the next question. Um, you've probably covered this a little bit, um, um, but I'll ask it anyway. How critical is EdTech in delivering this new learning experience? Well, of course, it's extremely important, Brian, because without the technology, we, we couldn't do any of this. We wouldn't be here today. Um, but I would say, you know, repeating what I said earlier, it, it's important, but not as important as the sound pedagogic practice and principles that underpin how you use the technology. You know, any tool is only as good as the person using it. Um, so that's really important. Um, and, you know, finding the technology that works for your situation um, and, um, you know, working with the providers and the suppliers to adapt it if necessary, because, you know, every institution is different, has different needs. So sometimes, you know, what comes out of the box isn't quite what you need and you need to be able to work with the suppliers very closely. And um, also, you know, the, the software licensing people, we're having to, you know, think about new ways of working with them as well, because the old models of just licensing software for a few computers in the classroom, it doesn't work in this new environment. Um, and, but you know, really um, a stable connection <laughs> and a stable platform, they're, they're the real essentials because if you haven't got a decent connection, it doesn't matter how good the tool is. And um, that's why a lot of our students, um, they like to come on campus, even if they're studying online, because we have a wonderful, um, very stable connection. Um, and, uh, you know, a stable platform, a platform that you can um, rely on to operate. I think those are the, the key things. And then you can enhance that with all the um, lovely things like the interactive polls and whiteboards and annotation tools and, um, you know, doing online video and streaming and um, interactive uh, performance and all sorts of things we can do online. There's very few things we can't. Um, from my own experience in fashion, you know, not being able to feel the fabric is a difficult thing when you're when you're doing online, but we have found ways around that even. So, um, you know, I think it's um, the, the, the the opportunities are, are limitless and the technology is evolving all the time. Um, so yes, it is going to be critical to have the right technologies, but also the right teaching methods to use them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Kim. Well, again, I think I need to connect back to what Julia is saying. And I, I would agree there ed tech is absolutely critical to the journey and the path that we take as we walk forward, but we have to be very, um, mindful about why we're selecting particularly particular ed tech that we're working with and I think when we think of when we reflect on the pedagogical approaches that we have and I think about what that looks like for a three-year-old an eight-year-old a 12-year-old and an 18-year-old you know there are uh, there is a need for us to be able to um, engage with ed tech organizations to be able to look at how we can further develop the tools to be able to bring the pedagogy to life within that virtual context. Um, I look at what our faculty have been doing when we've been in home-based learning, and I have such deep admiration and gratitude for their agility and the way they have opened their hearts to learning and exploring and testing and trialing and experimenting with different ed tech solutions that has enabled our children at every age in our school to be able to be engaged 
and we see that motivation. And you know, we see our three and four year olds jump online with great excitement and they are there and they are connected and they are with their teachers. We watch our senior students who are there and they are present and they are motivated and they're engaged and they are producing great outcomes. I think educational technology has been accelerated due to the experience that we've been in. And I guess my hope, my hope for where we go to as we walk forward is that we continue to accelerate and push that area, that we don't just come out the other side and say, okay, well, now we can access campuses, we can kind of relax, we can sit where we are, and that we then sit in that space as education tends to do for another 10 to 20 years. Um, I think we have had an experience which is giving us a really unique opportunity to be able to continue to grow and evolve and to take our communities on that journey. Um, so I think EdTech, as we move forward, what does that look like? Does that mean that some of the the frameworks that we put around a, a K to 12, EE to 12 schoolhouse, do they start to look a little different? Do things like timetables and school day structures start to look a little different? You know, do we find ways to create more opportunities for learners at all ages to have more agency and more autonomy and more opportunity to apply knowledge within um, some mindful space? I think it's it's an exciting space to be in at the moment, right across all sectors. Okay, thank you very much, Kim. I'll stay with you now for the last question. And that's, we focused on the environment and the institution and on the students. And the last question is about um, the faculty or academics. What are you doing to improve the digital fluency of faculty to advance their digital literacy for better adoption of technology in the new normal? It's a really good question, Brian, because I think every one of our educators is at a different point in their own education, uh, digital fluency continuum. Um, I think it's a really important area for us to be able to invest professional learning in. Um, as a cognitive schools group, the, the development of uh, digital fluency for all of our faculty across our 83 schools globally is one of our global strategic objectives. And for us here at Ishmik, the development of digital fluency across our faculty is also one of our strategic goals as we continue to walk forward. What do we need to do? We need to invest in time, ongoing professional learning, create authentic opportunities for collaboration so faculty can teach each other and share different um, ed tech solutions that they've found. I think we also need to make sure that we are connecting with ed tech providers and looking for um, the skills and the expertise that sit out within other industries that can help us as educators learn and grow. Um, we need to continue to work on how we can uh, morph and build and create digital content or digital learning engagements so that we can hold on to those as we walk forward. Um, and I think just like we talk in terms of student learning, I think we've got to find and continue to hold on to those hooks and motivate our faculty and engage them with the need to continue to upskill and grow and further develop their digital fluency. Okay, thank you very much, Kim. And now I'm back to you, Julia, for the higher education perspective on this. Yeah. Um, well, of, of course, Brian, all of our lecturers are, are experienced when they join us, but we, we have a, a program um, that uh, can carry them through from all different levels. Um, so when they first join us, they will be introduced into our way of teaching and learning, which is around authenticity, authentic assessment and authentic learning. Um, and that, of course, includes digital technologies. Um, but um, upskilling is, is, you know, throughout your life cycle in, in education is really important. Um, you know, learning is a lifelong activity, not just for students, but also for our staff. Um, so we have a whole suite of um, opportunities for staff to engage in development. Um, these include um, bite-sized kind of lunchtime, um, upskilling, how to use mirror board or something like that activities, um, through to full qualifications in teaching and learning and uh, national recognition programs like uh, teaching fellowships. Um, and most importantly, um, we also learn from each other with our knowledge sharing sessions. And I think these are the ones that are in a way the most important because 
um, people can show how they've used a technology in their classroom and um, how they've made it successful and what the problems were and how they worked around them and overcame them. And I think that that kind of activity is, is you know, possibly one of the most valuable that we have. Um, and of course, you know, we want to continue to introduce new, new thinking um, as well as new tools. And I think those two things also um, go very closely together. Um, and, you know, our staff are very eager to, to learn new, new ways of working and um, to integrate them into, into their classroom and into their teaching. Um, it benefits them and it benefits their students. And, um, you know, the, I, I, I don't see any downsides to it <laughs> at, at all. Of course, all these things take time. And I think that's one of the things you, you have to be aware of is to give your staff time to um, develop and to um, integrate these new skills. And that's one of the, I think, the most important things um, if you're thinking of bringing in new technology, make sure that the time and the support are there. And it's not just one off support when you start, but um, continuing support, because, you know, um, you might may see an idea and, and not actually have an opportunity to implement it for a little while. And then you might need to go back and just revisit something to, um, you know, update yourself a little bit before you implement it in the classroom. So um, time, support, and an understanding of why you're doing it. Um, and I think those things, you know, staff um, love to learn new things. That's why we're in education. Thank you. Right. Thank you to both of you. I think it's, it's great to hear that um, the staff have got this attitude to want to learn, to want to adapt. And one of the things um, I'd say all across education is it's definitely not a very boring time to be involved in education, whether you're faculty or a student. Um, thank you. We've now heard from the education providers, and now we'd like to move over um, to the EdTech providers. And I would like to now um, ask um, Mr. Swamy a few questions um, to hear what um, it's like from your perspective. So the first question is, what are your views on the adoption of technology by education institutions since the start of the current crisis? Yeah. Um, well, the adoption has uh, evolved rapidly. There have been uh, two distinct uh, stages. Um, initially, it was more uh, you know, reactive, ad hoc, uh, somehow um, get the, you know, uh, uh, acquire the tools to you know, avoid any disruption and uh, continue to do what, um, find a way to do what you have to do, um, keep delivering the, the education. So that was okay, very important. And I think people reacted uh, quite fast and, and some, somehow got past those uh, hurdles. That was the first stage. Then I think maybe about, um, in our experience, in about you know, six months later, people started looking at how they wanted the tech to look like, what they wanted it to do for them, right? Um, they have gone, to, and the institutions have gone through their own journey and uh, 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 restructured themselves. Uh, the instructors have uh, gone through their evolution. Uh, their content has changed and how they want to engage the, the learners have changed significantly. And there's been a much more, uh, the last one year has been really welcoming, you know, from our point of view, uh, where people were much more clearer about um, what, what, how they have changed and how they want tech to support them. So that's been quite welcoming. And the, the discussions today are a lot more effective. It, it was very effective even at the first stage because it was the need of the hour, it had to be fast. But now it's a bit more um, tuned to what is needed and every institution has got their own journey. The, and the, so that's the, uh, the user's uh, perspective. And from an institution's perspective, um, we're also seeing a, a change on how the institution want to you know, brand themselves, how they want to look like in the current uh, crisis. Earlier, there's, you know, institutions are very passionate about the campus, the facilities, and why are they passionate about that? Because they want to give a very good experience to the, uh, to the students and to the uh, learners, the, learner, the instructors and the, and the learners. They need to be quite motivated and happy about the campus. So there's been a lot of um, um, investment and in whatever way they'd like to make the campus better, it, they've done that. Now there's another, the campus is, is hardly being seen and hopefully we'll, we will get back to a, you know, a balance here. 
you the institutions are you know are being seen as uh, you know what is the digital experience that they are offering how digitally uh, you know savvy the 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 uh, instructors are and how they are able to bring along the the learners i get we talked about uh, you know talked about the the connectivity issues and there are so many things tech is not just just about the tools but also about how are um, we able to connect and bringing the entire the institution the learners and the instructors all together with a with a clarity on you know where we are moving and uh, the tech is is um, becoming is a much more stronger enabler that's how we see it uh, so it's a, it's much more uh, meaningful it started in a way and it's a lot more meaningful today that's my view of uh, you know what's going on institution instructor and learner perspective okay thank you very very much um the next question is what in your view do you think are the challenges in transitioning to a more digitally focused learning model for these institutions yeah i think the in, the instructors um, um ability to you know, their ability to uh, to to figure out how they can keep their set of uh, uh, learners engaged so engaging them in a in a digital medium is quite different the same method is not going to to work anymore but i think people have also starting to figure that out so how how do you want to keep your uh, learners engaged that's that's the uh, that's the key and the different people are doing it in in their own way um and what kind of uh, you know content um so you've been uh, people they have been used to the the, the very traditional chocolate board or they have used some technologies earlier which was not absolutely mandatory but it was a uh, nice to uh, have but now that becomes your uh, your the medium of uh, delivering uh, your curriculum then there's got to be a way of you know, how do you get every uh, you know every part of the the curriculum in a way how could you structure how could you develop it digitally and deliver so that it's in, it creates an engaging experience i think that's the space um, that uh, is evolving quite uh, rapidly that's been the challenge and i think uh, people are overcoming it and still there's there's uh, there's a lot to um, to happen now while while this evolves there's another challenge already coming up now which is a hybrid right so you have some learners who are going to be online some you know in the class or maybe have alternate sessions so how do you how do you deal with that but it needs to be continuous the experience needs to be fulfilling for the learners i'm sure we'll start uh, learning that part as well okay i think it's um interesting when you talk about hybrid because um there have been situations for you have students in the class and students not in the class and i've experienced that myself and i think both of our institutions here are are taking that strongly into consideration and of course in the future it will be a mixture of technology and face to face um um regardless so moving on um to the next question um how can educational institutions to opportunities how can cloud based solutions help address these pressing challenges sure. um for me personally while our company and um, our team is working with institutions on the uh, on the transformation in enabling them my personally i've been working on this specific question what are what opportunities has it uh, created uh, a number of things have happened um earlier the, the uh, uh, college or an institution or a school it was a lot about the campus it was about the physicality of the campus and how nice or how um fulfilling that campus is, as an as an environment um now there's uh, the physicality is sort of uh, less relevant now at least for the moment um you have a much wider uh, learner base earlier there was a geography there was a specific uh, uh, you know who who can you attract what kind of learners can you attract and uh, there are some institutions that are able to get people flying in from other countries to come in and, and study and they have that kind of a uh, um uh, um this, there are there's a uh system that they've created that does that get learners coming from far off there are other institutions that are able to attract from a uh, from a from the local uh, the region so all kinds of institutions have been there so when you go digital uh, the the parameters completely change um any uh, there's no more uh, you know security that uh, you have a market base at these regions you have a brand name and you are able to attract um uh, learners from those regions um now that's changing 
nothing can be taken for granted anymore. Um, institutions will have to evolve. So that's the uh, institutions will have to evolve, and you have a much bigger uh, letter base. You can go after any um, uh, a much larger letter base and much you know, many more geographies, and uh, the the cost of growth is going to be significantly um, less. Uh, so what you invest on to grow is very different. So you're not investing in classrooms and campuses and, and more facilities. You're investing on probably more content, more, more digitally you know, savvy um, uh, instructors and more on, on instructor upskilling programs, uh, learner upskilling programs. And how, so the different things that you're uh, investing on. But I think uh, the ability to, to reach out to a much larger base will be the, is a big opportunity. How you go about it? How do you, uh, you know, digitally market yourself? How do you present yourself? How you deliver the curriculum? That's where the investments got to be. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, opened up significantly. Okay, the last question, you've already um, 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 talked about some of the points about blended learning or um, hybrid learning models and moving away from purely campus facilities. How can educational institutions take advantage of ed tech to successfully um, fast track this transition? Yeah. Um, I think we can just simply uh, keep it quite simple. Uh, these uh, we don't have to treat this as a as a as a challenge. Probably it's um, we just treat it as a, a business as usual. I would I would like to you know flip that around, and also my my conversations with uh, with institutions um, sort of lining up in this manner. We don't have to force uh, the learners to go through a particular with a uh, the program with a minimum. Uh, uh, with a maximum residency period and learn with one institution and earn your degree in a specific time scale. Uh, now, things are changing. Students, uh, learners can learn in multiple institutions and it's okay to do that. We are probably better off, uh, so that may reduce the number of courses a, student, a learner takes within a particular institution, but probably it's better off for the learner and for the institution to allow them to be a bit, uh, you know, maybe they take a few courses in a, in a different institution uh, where they feel it's it's suitable for them, but then if you can be that the guiding institution that will award the the degree or the or the certificate to the learner, but then give them a bit more flexibility. There are certain courses where it's okay for them to just you know self learn. There are enough tools today and just get assessed. So we can go with the um, with a model where it's more suitable to the learner and 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 adopt adopt that. Of course, that will present some some more challenges which we need to overcome, but it's probably easier to deal with it in that manner rather than fix it as you know, hybrid, you've got to do certain, uh, things in a certain way. So there could be programs, students, uh, learners can choose. I want to go completely online. Um, maybe just come in for a couple of uh, you know, tutoring sessions or, or uh, to get uh, you know, things clarified. Uh, and others may choose to, to come on campus. So go with more, provide more options to learners and learners will figure out what they want. And then you may get more patterns that are repeatable, and then you could you could adjust according to that. That's my view of uh, um, how to deal with the uh, with the hybrid. Just leave it. Uh, see the see the patterns that the learners are following. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I think um, what um, Julia mentioned earlier was there was never an old normal. So why do we expect to have a new normal? And I think this is very much evolving. The, blended learning, hybrid learning. And I think there's going to be different markets for, for different types or different um, business models um, for different um, demands of the students. Um, I would like to remind the audience to please um, 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 write your message or write your questions into chat. And I would like to say thank you to the um, three panelists. And now I've got the very difficult task of trying to summarize such a wealth and depth of information. But I, I will do that because I think um, um, it's been very, very, um, um, how would you say, um, exciting to hear that even in all the doom and gloom and challenges and everything else, that all of our panelists have come across in a very positive way. And I've actually seen the current crisis as an opportunity to fast track what they're doing, um, incorporating technology, um, finding new and different ways to deliver to the students. And I think, I think that is, um, 
I would say, a real um, plus for our education institutions, particularly the ones that are here today, that they were able to face the challenge and not only um, take it on, but beat it and move forward. So uh, I think we look at it from the student perspective. And when we started off, our students were using technology. So at least when we started moving to 100% online due to the current lockdowns, um, we, the students were, this is what they did. They, they have technology in front of them, which is very, very good. I think what was also important is um, that um, while um, the technology is great, it supports the pedagogy. In other words, it's there to support the teachers um, to make sure that the learning outcomes are achieved. And the ability of the institutions and the staff to be flexible and the students to be flexible is um, truly amazing. Um, Kim mentioned social emotional, and I think that's very, very important. And that regardless of whether you're doing face-to-face -face, uh, using technology, or blended or 100% online, you have to realize that you're dealing with people and that you need to look at the social emotional aspects of this, not only through the crisis, which obviously was very important, but afterwards, you know, so um, that sort of support has to be provided. And it's great to see that uh, that has already been strongly um, considered by our um, educational institutions. Um, one thing that was mentioned was stable connections, and I think we need to to um, um, be pushing um, the Vietnamese government. In, I know there's people from many other countries, and you can do that, but I think um, they were never going back. We need to be have the the infrastructure so that people can learn successfully successfully online. And it has, it has been a little bit challenging um, in Vietnam. And in my, um, we say, brief experiences with teaching online, um, one simple thing I learned was after a day of class, reboot your computer and make sure your computer is fresh and ready to start. So, and just to finalize, I think um, it's great to see that um, the the learning outcomes and the achievement of the students is of prime importance. And that, um, and, and I think um, Julia mentioned it earlier, was that in some ways, actually the quality improved. And that's, um, I would say, a credit to um, all of our panelists here. So now um, what I would like to do is to um, now open it up to the um, audience to ask questions and I'm going to check for questions here. And I've got one question here. Um, and it, I just need to, okay. Um, just bear with me from um, Win Man. Um, thank you for your sharing today. We understand the importance of transforming and the aspect of technology um, on our life during COVID-19. Could you um, share with us about your solutions and experiences? I know you've already covered this in many ways, but I think it would be great for each of you just to talk about it again, to reinforce it. Okay, Maybe. Well, if, if I jump in there, we're always willing to share our expertise um, with, with others and to reach as many audiences as possible. We, we've actually... Um, from RMIT also running um, some webinars and seminars on, on how to um, engage digitally and uh, enhance digital teaching and learning. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, we'd be more than happy to uh, contribute to any future events um, around this area, um, either myself or other colleagues within RMIT University. So um, I'll uh, go online and uh, Follow the link and uh, register. Thank you. <laughs> Kim? And likewise, I, as a learning organisation, um, learning is for all of us, and we would be very delighted to continue conversations around our experiences and also to hear experiences from um, 
many, many people who have learned so much and grown so much over this time. So I too will follow the link and see where that takes me. Um, I just, I would probably just take a moment just to say that transformation is a collective enterprise and the more that we can share our experiences, the more we can build each other's um, um, knowledge and understandings, the greater our collective efficacy is, the greater the impact we can have for the individuals that we work with and are taking on learning journeys. So um, it's great opportunities to keep sharing. Um, and of course, through AMCHAM Education and Training Committee, um, and also through ISHMIC, there are opportunities to engage in conversations. Um, there is a series of digitization and learning webinars that will be coming um, by AMCHAM Education and Training Committee soon. So I encourage whoever's in this call today to also participate in those. Okay, thank you, Kim. Swami? Yeah, engaging in, um, um, in, in sessions you know, similar to these has been our primary, that's been our main job. I've been doing that uh, for a while now. So we will have, we do participate in a number of uh, uh, sessions, myself and my, my colleagues, we continue to do that. We'll click the link and see uh, how we can contribute. And we also uh, are open to if um, any, any, anyone needs to have a more detailed uh, conversation at the next level to understand and um, more than happy to get into you know, individual conversations on specific uh, aspects of uh, digital transformation. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, just one more question here. Um, how, how can students um, move to this environment and new features after this pandemic? And maybe we'll start again with you, Julia. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, we, one of the things that we're doing is we're doing inductions for our students before they start to introduce them to the tools and how we operate so that they're not stepping into a completely alien environment on their, their first day. And that support as, you know, is, is ongoing. And as, as Kim said, I think it's, it's as much about the emotional support and the confidence and um, providing that opportunity for socialization is, is just as important as the, the teaching and learning activities. So um, we, we offer you know, um, a good induction program to help the students to familiarize themselves. But I think um, a, lot of the, a lot of the students coming through, they may not be used to higher education, but they are certainly used to working online now. We may do it in a slightly different way, but um, we found them to be very adaptable and flexible. And we just keep reminding them that if they need help, there's lots of people who can help them and to just let us know they need help and we'll we'll provide that support. Um, but as I said earlier, we do find a lot of students really thriving in this environment. Um, others obviously um, have, have a preference for other ways of teaching. And, and by continuing to offer, um, you know, a, a different menu of options as we go forward is, I think, is really key. And I think one of the um, interesting uh, points that Swami raised was this one of being able to collaborate amongst institutions. We already have a very major established exchange program where students can um, visit institutions and we recognize their credits and vice versa. Brings a lot of international students into our campus, which is lovely. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's opportunities to do that virtually. Um, you know, it doesn't always mean getting on an aeroplane. Um, obviously, we, we also think about the environment as we go forward and technology can help us with solutions that are also better for our environment. Um, and I did notice one of the upsides after the lockdown was a, a massive reduction in pollution, <laughs> noise and uh, all of the sorts. So I think, you know, let's, let's take the best of all of this um, to make a better, brighter future for everybody. Thank you very much, Julia. And I think that's an aspect is the, the um, integrate or move it. There's one more question in the Q&A window. Should I read that out for you? Yes, please. Uh, how important will personalized learning play a role considering data is going to play an increasingly important role? I can, um, I can take that, uh, right. Um, <coughs> uh, I think the question it talks about personalized uh, learning and it talks about data. Um, in my view, uh, in my, as, as far as I understand, personalized learning is a slightly different uh, you know, aspect. But I think the, the key, the, the underlying or the intended question is around uh, uh, 
I'm out in the open and uh, is my data uh, protected? Right? Um, so this, this area is obviously getting a significant uh, uh, um, push out of how we, you know, the data privacy and the, the uh, what data we're allowed to share and not share and, and uh, you know, th those aspects are being um, enforced by several governments now rapidly. A number of governments have uh, uh, enforced its policies that probably have been there, but they're sort of enforcing it. And technology is rapidly uh, implementing the, you know, the, the, the concept to, to share data and what data can cannot be shared. There's a, um, in, in my view, I think this, it's uh, it's it's a journey. It's it's uh, it's begun and it's going you know quite fast. Uh, but I think uh, uh, being out there, whether it's edtech or not, being out there in the open, um, I think we're all aware of. Um, what you know, what the what the what the challenges are, but uh, but in education, I think the demand on personal information is very very uh, limited. Uh, the institution can sort of you know govern and protect the, the institutional data. I think the education ed tech systems have been doing that for a very long time. Uh, but it, but in in terms of the engagement, I don't think there's uh, the, the, there's a significant uh, increase in the risk of uh, of exposure. Uh, that that's my view, and I don't think that's something we need to be unduly you know, concerned about right now. While things are not perfect, nothing has become you know, significantly riskier than than before. That's my view um, to to Ranganathan. We have one more question in the uh, uh, chat. Uh, I've got the question here. Uh, maybe I'll start, Kim. I'll direct this one initially at you. Will the educators, teachers, stakeholders be overwhelmed with learning all of these new tech? Technologies to do their day-to-day -day teaching. Will these make teachers more interested or find this um, a hassle? Um, what is your suggestion to overcoming this and to make the transition easier? Thanks, Brian. It's a really good question that's asked because I think when there is change and transition and transformation, it can very easily be quite overwhelming. Um, I think Julia spoke about the importance of time I think time is a really important um, gift that we can give to our teams and space is a very important thing that we need to make. I also think it's really important as organizations that we are very mindful about identifying priorities and also coming back to a comment Julia made earlier, ensuring that the ed tech solutions that we're finding are enhancing our pedagogy and driving us down a path which is enhancing the learning experience. Um, so I think we have to become um, critical. We have to evaluate effectiveness of tools. I think we need to make sure that what we are selecting to embrace and work with um, is creating or are effective within our pedagogical context, and that is different from organisation to organisation. Um, I also think that when we think about transition, um, we and change, we also have also and always need to be very mindful of that change management process that sits within that journey, and that we will go through a space where we will be euphoric about the exciting new tools that we have and the new ways that we can work. We will encounter challenges, um, and ultimately we will work, walk through those challenges and come out with solutions which are going to be in the best interest of the, the communities that we work with. Um, but I think it's taking the journey, it's being reflective, it's being mindful of space and time, and it's creating a space which is safe for our teams to be able to explore and for our students at whatever age group they are to be able to explore and engage with new technologies. Thank you. Okay. Um, Julia, have you got something to add? Yeah, I mean, t time is the most valuable asset that we have. And, you know, just making sure that, um, you know, you when you're planning your staff time and you're planning in some time for this development um, and and also, you know, making sure that it's um, it's timely as well. Um, you know, there is a tendency, I think, in some organisations to do all the induction in day one, give everybody all the information. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. And then three weeks later, um, the person's completely overwhelmed and lost. So I think it's introducing things also in a timely manner as and when they're needed. And, um, 
you know, I think this is where the kind of the bite size training is really useful because you don't always need two whole days at a workshop to, to learn something. Mm -hmm. It could be 20 minutes. It could be something very practical that you, you just want to learn how to do X or Y. Um, so having those support systems in place, I think, and, and also just not overwhelming people with too many forms of change at once. Um, so, you know, prioritizing, as Kim says, you know, what are the key things we want the, the, the staff to be able to do? Um, and it might be different for different, different staff and uh, different roles in the institution. Um, and planning that, uh, I think, you know, some careful forward planning um, and, and, and understanding the impact of change that um, it can make people a little bit nervous. Um, you know, it can feel like they're taking a risk when they bring something new into their classroom. Um, so, you know, giving them the confidence and the support that if you try this, there's backup for you and there's um, other people have done it before and, and this is, you know, the best way to do it. And that's where the, the skill sharing comes comes in so yes it, it uh, but I think the, the other thing is that um, most technologies used properly will eventually save you time mm -hmm. so investing 20 minutes or 30 minutes here can save you hours and hours and hours later so I think and um, you know helping people to understand that what the return on investment is um, for gaining a new skill that's also important thank you very much and Swami any last words from you Um, I think it, it, it's been quite inadequately you know, covered by, by Kim and, uh, and Kim. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Before I hand back to Caroline, um, I would like to say thank you very much to the three panelists, Julia from RMIT University, Vietnam, Kim from the International School Ho Chi Minh City, and um, Swami from Camo. I think your, your knowledge and experience and your ideas have been um, very well taken by the audience. And it's great to have such expertise. Um, rather a short time for it, but thank you all. Thank you for the three of you very, very much. Um, we really appreciate um, your sharing. And now I'll hand back to you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian, for that wonderful uh, conversation. On behalf of CAMO and Snittel Technologies, uh, I'd like to thank Julia, Kim, and Brian for taking the time out to be a part of this conversation. Like Julia mentioned, technology is as good as the people who use it. It's also great to see how institutions have uh, fast-tracked themselves to embrace technology. And uh, of course, the agility, flexibility, and the resilience is what is going to help uh, uh, to survive in these challenging uh, situations. Uh, it's a beautiful morning, a great conversation. Uh, we look forward to assisting the institution that is uh, looking to change. Uh, but you can stay in uh, touch with us, respond to us, how you felt about the session. We will come back to you with more sessions uh, in the coming days. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day.